own reality. We cannot put it in the people who survived are here. You know, it's not like we're talking about the destruction of the first temple where there are no survivors. We need something that's a major piece. And so they created Yom HaShoah during this period of time, which is in keeping with what I said, right? The idea that this is a time that's one of mourning. So the idea of commemorating the Holocaust, Yom HaShoah, makes sense. But lo and behold, the United Nations didn't know the Jewish calendar necessarily, and during this time is the creation of the State of Israel as well. And so to commemorate Yom HaZikaron, which is the day before Yom HaTzma'ut, which is the celebration of the creation of the State of Israel, we have a mourning day for those soldiers who have died. Yom HaZikaron, their memorial day, the next day is Yom HaTzmaim, which is a full-blown celebration wherever it falls in these 50 days. And so the state of Israel has sort of added a few. So that's the other thing that happens during these times. And in the world Jewish, you know, world jewelry, um, not jewelry, but jewelry, um, <laughs> if you remember Saturday Night Live, uh, <laughs>
everybody has to figure out how to kosher a microwave oven, how to get it kosher. It's found with heat. You traditionally do it with a blowtorch and heat, okay? You don't want to do that with a microwave, okay? <laughs>
commandments yet. We were just getting it. So the idea of kashrut wasn't yet established. So we had to do that, which is a very she thing about it. So. <laughs> um, the other thing we do is stay up all night and study Torah. So we have a tikkun Lael Shavuot, which was the rabbis who created that, where you stay up all night and you study. Because we stayed up all night to get the Ten Commandments. There was not a sound, so we stay up all night and we study. So those are the traditions of Shavuot. But in the temple times, we went to the temple one of three times in the year. So um, if you ever go to Israel, on the south wall is a great little museum. It's a little historic museum, but it has a great video that basically um, kind of creates what it would have been during Jesus' time to go to the temple and what it looked like. And it's a really, it's a great simulation. It's in sort of a caricature form. Um, and it shows what life in the first century was like right where you were standing, here at the southern wall, but right by the western wall and um, where the temple stood. So if you ever in Israel, just make sure you go there. It's, uh, it's a great, it's a great little simulation that can show you all that, that happened. Um, so it's, it's good. Well, yes? I'm wondering about what it is that happens on that day that would lead Luke to the tongues of fire. <coughs> I'm trying to, to pick up that imagery, and I, that's why I'm that's the connection I'm trying to make, and I'm not finding any fire. He, he talks about, I haven't read the book. Um, you know, I think that's nothing. I mean, I think that's Luke. I mean, that's, uh, he's, he's using an analogy, not a description of what happened. And so, I mean, I don't know. But I, I'm trying to figure no, out I, I know. what it is. That, that I, don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's I think the tongues of fire really have nothing to, okay. to do with this. Well, I was wondering sort of the greater context of, you know, in the midst of this pilgrimage festival, this is what, you know, Luke describes as what's, what's happening. So thematically <coughs> rather than... I'm not sure I understand your question. If I'm not answering your question, I don't understand. Well, I, I don't I don't think I think we're all asking. I think we're all asking. This thing. Um the, So we're remembering again, it's a it's you know, during the time of the temple it was another harvest celebration. It wasn't really more than that. So right. it was this reality of thanking God for what has been given. Um, on an agricultural perspective, but then it was probably later connected to giving a tour. Yeah, Luke, yeah. Um, so because, I don't know what Luke was saying. I mean, Luke, Luke was talking about you know, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Oh, right, right. The Holy Spirit. Spirit. So, yeah. so I so think that, that piece yeah. does not yeah. come up. Um, wouldn't be us at all. But I think what I was trying to hear if there was oh, something okay. in, the, in, this, in this ceremony and the, in the ritual that made the thing of fire. And that's what, you know, that's what I was is there any celebration in Judaism of the burning bush? Uh, that, <laughs> that would be this. No, no, but I mean, it's fine. It's an appearance of God is in fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, that's why it's a different tradition. You need it to create something different, too, which is perfect. I mean, you know, that is where Paul's letters really kind of document that distinction. You know, you don't need to circumcise your sons anymore. You need to, you know, go forward. You don't need to keep kosher anymore because they understood that breaking bread with Gentiles was going to bring Gentiles into their midst and into conversation. What happens when you're friends and you break bread? So the difference is, you know, <coughs> Christianity is not Jewish. It's based on it. It's got its foundation in it, but it's different. And it's got to create a difference in order to become different. And so that's okay. So this whole idea of the Holy Spirit, well, he, or whoever picked the, or whatever happened historically here, it's really disrespectful. They picked the idea of this time, which makes sense, thematically. That makes so total sense. If you're giving Torah, then the idea of the Holy Spirit and and descending makes total sense that it should happen around here. So they knew their Jewish history and they knew their Jewish tradition. 
but then they needed to move away from it and break away, otherwise it would become the same. So I, you know, personally think so. he created something different. If he had a theological lens, he needed to move people away from this, um, even though probably he wasn't talking to Jews, he was talking to Gentiles. He wasn't really trying to convert Jews, because if you haven't figured it out, we're kind of unconvertible. <laughs> it's good news. Yeah, well, we're pretty, we're stubborn people. <laughs> it's good. I like it. I like being stubborn. Yeah. So here's a thought. This was a pilgrimage, right? Yes, it was these a pilgrimage. Were, these were bringing in people from different That's right. parts. That's right. Maybe they spoke a little different dialect. Yes. And maybe yes. that was stretched to say, well, let's say there were some Greeks in there, and let's yes. say there were some others, and we were all speaking different languages and speaking in tongues. I could see where that. that oh, be. he has the speaking in tongues. Ooh. Well, is that the first? <laughs> no, that's what he, people were well, speaking. This is a little different. Oh, okay. Yeah. But is that different than Pentecost? Well, people who were Greek and Gentiles would not be coming to no, Jerusalem. No, I didn't say. Right? That. Yeah, yeah. The but the idea of people coming to this what we call Pentecost, uh -huh. were coming from different places. In, in your tradition, they were coming from different places in the country. Our tradition said they were coming, they were people from many places. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. But the but point of it is they could understand each other. When the, the tongues of fire came, the spirit descended, and everybody understood everybody. I see. The kind of undoing the Tower of Babel. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. And that has no basis in it's beautiful, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, it's beautiful. Um, you know, what's interesting is, if I can speak a moment about Jesus and the Last Supper and all that was happening, um, what happens in Jerusalem in all these pilgrimage festivals, but some are more important than others, you know, it's a Passover, even today is the most important, like one of the most important holidays within Judaism, right? Um, so Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Well, you have to understand, and this is what this little simulation does, but I'm going to give it to you because I'm assuming not all of you will make it to Israel. Um, <clears throat> is that in the time of Jesus, you have to remember is that. Um, <laughs> Between the first destruction of the first temple and the destruction of the second temple, the story of Hanukkah happens. And Hanukkah is a major transition within Judaism. Hanukkah is not just the eight presents that is so superficial that in my community I try to move them away from presents because it has nothing to do with what Hanukkah really represents. Hanukkah was the beginning of rabbinic Judaism. Because what was happening during Hanukkah was that people were being taken off the land. It was the first, if you remember the 80s, the farm crisis here in the Twin Cities where people, family-owned farms were beginning to not be able to survive, right? It was the beginning of, it was a farm crisis of its time. So Jews were being taken off the land, why? Because the Greek, Alexander the Great, who came into Israel, loved by Jews, that's why so many Jews are called Alexander and Alexandra, not a Jewish name, definitely based on Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great began to bring in this idea of supporting a city, a polis, because that was a Greek value. Jews were being taken off the land as shepherds and as farmers and brought into the city and became leather workers and vessel workers and became different kinds. So what happens is if we're off the land and we're supposed to bring the sheep from our flock or the, the wheat from our, from our harvest to the temple to offer it, we don't have it anymore because we're in the city. So we have to buy it now in order to give the sacrifice. It's not going to uphold itself forever now, right? That's why the money changers that are in the Jesus story, that happened because Jews were taken off the land and needed to buy the goods. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem 
on Passover. Now, I went, my children have studied there. For the last five years, one of my children has been in Israel and on Passover through the year or whatever. We've gone to Passover. We went to Jerusalem. We were staying in, in Tel Aviv. We went to Jerusalem for the day. Oh my God. It was crazy. A million people came into this little city and it took us an hour to go 15 minutes from Jerusalem to um, a little town where the Maccabees actually came from, right? It takes 15 minutes to drive that. It took us over an hour. We were stuck in traffic because a million people were coming in. That's what happened with Jesus. The influx of people during his pilgrimage holidays was so immense, especially at Passover, that the authorities are ever more vigilant, right? So that's the situation that he came into. He had to go, and if you look in the bottom on the south wall, you'll see little, like, mar a market that got set up outside of the temple so that Jews could buy their sacrifice because they didn't have it anymore. He was a carpenter. He wasn't a shepherd. He wasn't a farmer. He didn't have it. So what do you do? Sort of like the Vatican. You know, you have to bring your passport to go into the Vatican. It's a city in and of itself. Well, Jerusalem and the temple was kind of a city in and of itself. It used a different monetary system because throughout Israel there are different coins and things depending on what city you live in. So you had to go and bring your coins that you brought from whatever city and change them for the Jerusalem coin, the coin of the area. And then you had to go down and buy your sacrifice, and then you went back up <laughs> to give your sacrifice, okay? So it was a lot of, so think about an influx of five times your population of the city having to do that. A lot of movement happening and a lot of stuff going on. So that's sort of the image that you have to understand when Jesus came to Jerusalem for his for the last Passover, right? He and then on top of it, he was a bit of a renegade, right? And so he was making a little trouble, and the authorities just swooped down and, because they were afraid that the trouble would then expand, and that can happen, you know. I mean, that kind of stuff can happen. So you get just I just like to give you a sense of what it was like at that time so that you better understand the story and the background and this little film kind of shows it in a beautiful way <clears throat> and shows the man going up and changing money, going down and buying the lamb, coming, it wasn't Jesus, it's just an everyday person Israelite who was in one of the pilgrimage holidays at the first century during that time and it's just a lovely kind of rendition. So you've just kind of got a sense here of what is behind the stories that you read as well, some of that piece. Good. Any some more questions? One more. Go for it. You brought up Rabbi Akiva and his freedom. Yeah. Did you observe anything about his death? Um, he had a horrible death. He had a horrible death. He was burned alive, wrapped in Torah, wrapped in a Torah, as well as the tradition says. Um, no, we do. I mean, it's not observed. It's not observed. It's kind of a team. You guys have to go to church, don't you? Yes. <laughs>